Okay, so our topic today was bites and stings. Uh, just a quick introduction. Um, some of the signals of or reactions to bites and stings can be dependent on a bunch of different things. So maybe one person will react in the same way or depending on how far along you are from the initial bite or sting, you can have different reactions. But some of the common things that a bite or sting can depend on are the area of the bite or sting and its type, whether it was from a spider or a scorpion, et cetera. Um, how much poison was injected if you get by, bit by a venomous snake. Um, you know, how much poison they inject into you can affect how you react, how long it's been since the bite or sting, and the size, weight, medical condition, and age of the victim. Uh, so the first uh, type of sting we're going to talk about is insects. So up to 5% of Americans have severe allergies to venom in bees, wasps, hornets, and yellow jackets. Very severe allergic reactions can result in about 34 deaths each year. Mild symptoms of insect bites include pain, swelling, redness, itching, warmth, like around the area that was stung, as well as hives. And some stings can lead to anaphylaxis. Uh, anaphylaxis is a severe life-threatening allergic reaction to venom, food, or medications, and it can be extremely fatal if not treated immediately. Uh, signs and symptoms to look out for are difficulty breathing, wheezing, and shortness of breath, tightness in your chest or throat, swelling of the face, neck, lips, or tongue, weakness, dizziness, or confusion, rash or hives, low blood pressure, and shock. If anaphylaxis occurs, you need to provide immediate care by either one, using an EpiPen, or two, administering supplemental oxygen and calling emergency services as soon as possible. So how do I know if it's anaphylaxis? So there's three situations uh, that are pretty common. The first is not knowing if the patient has been exposed to an allergen. So at that point, you're supposed to look for any skin reactions such as hives, itchiness, or flushed skin, or swelling of the face, neck, tongues, or limp, lips, plus trouble breathing or signs and symptoms of shock. And scenario two is when you think the patient may have been exposed to an allergen, and you can look for any two of the following. Any skin reaction, swelling of the face, neck, tongue, or lips, trouble breathing, signs and symptoms of shock, nausea, vomiting, cramping, or diarrhea. And the third scenario is you know that the patient has been exposed to an allergen and you should look for trouble breathing or signs and symptoms of shock. So EpiPen, or as they're like professionally known as are epinephrine, auto injectors, they are a way to quickly and efficiently deliver medication to someone experiencing anaphylaxis. Most often one dose is enough, but some people may need two doses. And if you have to administer a second dose, you need to wait at least five minutes. And depending on how much time has passed since someone was stung, the person may need assistance using the EpiPen. And that assistance can go from anywhere from just having to go grab it or actually injecting the person yourself. And if you're ever in a situation where you need to help someone administer it, here's what you do. You hold the leg firmly above the knee. You locate the mid outer thigh and you uncap your injector. You activate the injector by pressing it against the thigh and you hold it in place until the medicine fully dispenses, which should take about three seconds, unless otherwise indicated on the box. And then afterwards, you massage the injection site for several seconds. Uh, if the patient is able, they can also do this. And then you dispose of the injector properly, making sure not to prick yourself or anyone else with the needle, or you give it to EMS to properly dispose themselves. And providing care for a sting. To remove a stinger, you should scrape it away with a plastic card or a chunk depressor. You should not use tweezers or your fingers to grab the stinger or venom sacs. 
because this could lead to more venom being released into the body. And then once the stinger's out, you want to clean and disinfect the site and apply a dressing. After that, you want to apply a cold pack to the site to reduce pain or swelling. Okay, so the next topic we're going to be doing is ticks. Um, yeah, okay, so the there's many diseases that can be transmitted from ticks, and uh, these some of these include Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, uh, Babesia infection, Ehrlichiosis, and Lyme disease. Okay, so Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is a bacterial infection that is caused by a tick bite. And some of the signs and symptoms are fever, vomiting, lack of appetite, nausea, muscle pain, rash, abdominal pain, severe headache, diarrhea, and joint pain. And then here is a picture of what the skin rash would look like for Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. And the next one is Babesia infection. A uh, Babesia infection is caused by microscopic parasites that are transmitted by ticks, which infects human red blood cells. Um, some signs and symptoms are nonspecific flu-like symptoms, which includes things like chills, sweats, fever, body aches, nausea and fatigue, uh, headache, loss of appetite, jaundice or dark urine, which is oftentimes due to anemia. Oh, no. Okay, um, the next one is Ehrlichiosis. Um, Ehrlichiosis is an illness that is caused by bacteria and is spread by tick bites. Um, again, some signs and symptoms include fever, fatigue, nausea, headache, muscle aches, vomiting, joint pains, cough, diarrhea, confusion, and occasionally a rash can occur. Um, the last one that we're gonna be discussing today is Lyme disease, which is also a bacterial infection that is caused by bites from an infected tick. And some signs and symptoms are fever, fatigue, a char characteristic skin rash that um, creates a bullseye appearance and a headache. And in this picture, you can see the bullseye rash that they're talking about. Okay, um, when it comes to providing care for tick bites, if you have a tick that becomes embedded into your skin, it is imperative that you remove it. And then there's some important steps to follow to remove the um, tick. So to remove it, you first need to put on gloves and then use tweezers to grasp the tick but you also need to focus um, heavily on making sure the tweezers are as close to the surface of the skin as possible. Um, then you're gonna pull with a force that is slow, firm, and steady to avoid ripping the tick apart and not getting all of it and leaving part of it stuck in your skin. Um, now you're gonna place the tick in a closed jar with rubbing alcohol, which will kill the tick. And then following this, it's important to clean the bite site with soap and water and you apply either antiseptic or antibiotic ointment. Um, then afterwards, it is always advised to seek medical advice due to the risk of contracting an illness through transmission of, from a tick. Even if you don't have symptoms immediately, it's still important to seek a med medical advice. Um, when removing tick bite or ticks, it's important to not burn the tick off or apply petroleum jelly or nail polish to the tick. Um, to protect yourself from tick bites, it's important to avoid um, tick infested areas such as the woods. Um, also, if you're going to be in tick, in tick infested areas, it's important to wear clothing that covers your skin. So one example of that could be wearing long pants that are tucked into your socks to make sure that your ankles aren't exposed and no ticks can get on your legs that way. Um, also, you can use tick repellent and um, checking yourself daily for ticks can also be effective in um, protecting yourself from tick bites.
Ne okay, my bad. Next, we're going to talk about spiders and scorpions, starting with spider bites. So few spiders in the United States have venom that caused serious illness or death. Um, the exception, however, coming from the bites of a black widow or brown recluse, which um, in rare instances can be fatal. Most spider bites resolve on their own with no adverse effects or scarring. However, the symptoms will vary depending on the amount of venom injected and the patient's sensitivity to the venom. Um, the only sure way of knowing a person has been bitten by a spider is to have witnessed it since spider bites can mimic other conditions. Um, bites usually occur on the hands and arms of people reaching into places where spiders are residing. So the first one, black widow. Um, the venom of a black widow contains neurotoxins and affects neuromuscular function. The bite is more painful and often the more deadly out of the two, um, especially in very young and older adult patients. Signs and symptoms to look for, the bite usually causes an, imme an immediate sharp um, pinprick pain, followed by a dull pain in the area of the bite. However, no pain may be felt initially. Um, other symptoms may include muscular rigidity in the shoulders, chest, back, and abdomen, restlessness, anxiety, dizziness, headache, and profuse sweating, weakness and dropping or swelling of the eyelids. And then antivenom, Antivenom is used to counteract the poisonous effects of the venom for black widow bites, but is rarely necessary in healthy adults. Um, okay, and the second is a brown recluse. The brown recluse is also called the fiddleback or violin spider because of the distinctive violin shaped pattern on the back of its front body section. The venom of recluse spiders is necrotizing, which means tissue destroying. Um, the spider bite may produce little or no pain initially, but localized pain develops an hour or more later. And then some signs and symptoms to look for are a blood, flu a blood, a blood filled blister from under the surface of the skin, sometimes in a bullseye pattern. Um, over time, the blister increases in size and eventually ruptures, leading to tissue destruction and a black scab. And that's a picture on the bottom right of one of the blisters. Okay, now we're gonna to move to scorpion stings. Um, scorpions typically live in dry regions of the southwestern United States and Mexico, but they are also common in other southern regions of the United States, including Florida. Um, scorpions are usually three inches long and have eight legs with crab-like pincers with a stinger on the end of their tails used to inject venom. Scorpions live in cool, damp places such as basements, they are most active in the evening and at night. Um, scorpions from the southeastern part are usually non-poisonous. The stings can cause localized allergic reactions similar to bee stings and can be cared for similarly. But since it's difficult to distinguish between poisonous and non-poisonous, um, all stings should be treated as medical emergencies. And then here's some common um, spider bite and scorpion sting stein symptoms. Um, a mark indicating a possible binger sting, severe pain in the sting or bite area, a blister, lesion, or swelling at the entry site, nausea and vomiting, stiff or painful joints, chills or a fever, difficulty breathing or swallowing or signs of anaphylaxis, sweating or salivating profusely, irregular heart rhythms, muscle aches or severe abdominal or back pain, dizziness or fainting, chest pain, elevated blood pressure and heart rate, and infection of the bite. Um, providing care for spider and scorpion stings. Um, if bitten by a spider or stung by a scorpion, wash the wound thoroughly and bandage it. Additionally, apply a um, topical antibiotic ointment to the bite to prevent infection. If, patients, if the patient is not sensitive to the medication, apply a cold pack to the site to reduce swelling and pain. And then if the symptoms worsen, the patient should be transported to a medical facility, keeping the bite, um, keeping the bitten area elevated and as still as possible. Okay, the next section will be venom, venomous snakes.
So between oh, between 7,000 and 8,000 people in the United States are bitten by venomous snakes annually, but only less than five people die from those bites. And so there are four different kinds of venomous snakes found in the United States, which consist of rattlesnakes, cottonmouth snakes, copperheads, and coral snakes. And rattlesnakes make up the majority of snake bites, but nearly all the deaths from snake bites are from rattlesnakes. And so here are just some images of the types of snakes. The top left is a rattlesnake. The top right is a cottonmouth. The bottom left is a copperhead, and the bottom right is a coral snake. So some of the signs and symptoms of a snake bite would be one to two distinct puncture wounds that may or may not bleed. And coral snakes have a distinct shape, which is a semi semicircular bite mark that they leave. Um, another symptom is severe pain and burning of the bite wound and swelling and discoloration of the wound site. And so when providing care, some things you should do are always call for advanced medical personnel. You should always wash the site of the bite with soap and water, and you should always keep the area at a lower level than the heart. And things you should not do are apply ice to the wound, cut the wound, apply suction, use a tourniquet, or use electric shock. So one technique for providing treatment is the pressure immobilization bandaging technique. And so this is a technique that involves using an elastic bandage to slow the spread of venom through the, lymph the lymphatic system. And evidence recommends only using this method for treating coral snake bites. And so the steps for applying would be first to check for feeling, warmth, and color of the bitten limb and note changes of the skin color and temperature. Then you place the end of the bandage against the skin and wrap with overlapping turns. The wrap should cover long body sections such as the arms or legs, and it should begin at the point farthest from the heart. And when wrapping joints, you should use a figure eight wrapping style in turns to wrap the joints. After applying the bandage, you should check above and below the injury for the feelings of warmth, um, just feeling in general and the color. And you should check the snugness of the bandage by sliding a finger un under the wrap, making sure that the wrap isn't too loose or too tight. You should keep the injured area lower than the heart level. And you should always transfer a patient using a stretcher or by carrying the patient with more than one person. And only allow the patient to walk if it's absolutely necessary. And so now we'll go on to marine life stings. So marine life stings, they vary from different places around the world. And in some places, they could even lead to death. And so the different types of marine life and the locations of these consist of jellyfish, which are commonly found in the east and west coasts of the continental United States, uh, Portuguese man o' war, who are normally found in tropical and subtropical waters, stingrays, which are tropical and subtropical waters, and sea urchins are found in oceans all around the world, in rock pools and mud, and on wave-exposed rocks, coral reefs, kelp forests, and seagrass beds. And so the, here are some images of the types of marine life. So the top left being the jellyfish, top right is the Portuguese man of war, which is known as a blue bottle jellyfish. The bottom left is a stingray, and the bottom right is a sea urchin. And so some of the signs and symptoms of marine life stings are red, raised, or purplish tentacle-shaped rashes, tentacles left from the creatures that are stuck to the skin, puncture wounds, pain or itching, swelling, signs and symptoms of an allergic reaction, and these stings can result in sickness and in extreme case, death. So when providing care, you should always call for advanced medical personnel and identify whether or not a patient has any history of allergic reactions to marine life stings. You should have the patient removed from a water source with the help of a lifeguard, but avoid touching them directly. And you should use the edge of something like a credit card or a seashell to scrape remaining tentacles away from the skin. You should irrigate the sting, the sting site with seawater for 30 seconds 
if it originated from a jellyfish. And you should not rub the wound or apply a pressure immobilization bandage. You should have the patient take a hot shower with temperatures around 113 degrees Fahrenheit or 45 degrees Celsius for around 20 minutes. Okay, moving on. Next, we will be talking about domestic and wild animals. So the most common type of animal bite from domestic or wild animals is that of a dog. Um, any bite from domestic or wild animals may result in an infection and also poses the risk of soft tissue damage. So one potential risk of a domestic or an wild animal bite is tetanus, which is caused by a bacteria and affects the nervous system. And so if a bite from an animal punctures the skin, it does pose a risk of getting of the person um, developing tetanus. Signs and symptoms include muscle spasms and tightness, um, primarily in the jaw and neck muscles, especially uh, closer to the time of the bite. But as time continues, these spasms can um, continue throughout the body. And the greatest form of prevention for tetanus is the tetanus vaccine um, can be given to everyone. And it is recommended that you get a booster every 10 years. Another potential risk factor of a wild or domestic animal bite is rabies, which is a virus that is transmitted through saliva. So again, similar to tetanus, if a bite punctures the skin, there's an increased risk that the victim may um, develop rabies. Signs and symptoms include feelings of tingling or twitching around the bite area, pain, fatigue, muscle spasms, along with many others. And the treatment for rabies is a vaccine. However, the vaccine can be used both as a treatment and a preventative measure. So it's recommended that you get a rabies vaccine um, throughout your life. But also if you are bit, most likely it will be recommended that you get another vaccine. Um, and treating rabies is really important because most oftentimes if rabies goes untreated, um, it will result in a fatality. So it's really important, obviously, to provide care after the bite from a domestic or wild animal. Um, and one of the first steps is removing the patient from the scene. Um, obviously, if you are in a situation with perhaps a dog or some other type of animal that poses a danger, you want to remove the patient from that situation and remove yourself from that situation to avoid another bite. However, it is important to remember that your primary concern should be caring for the patient, not necessarily handling the animal, unless, of course, the animal continues to pose a threat. Um, treatment for domestic and wild animal bites can vary depending upon the severity of the bite. For minor wounds, you should clean them with generous amounts of saline or clean water, control the bleeding, and then transport or at the very least advise the patient to see a medical professional. Um, as with tetanus and rabies, immunizations um, play a crucial role in providing care for these injuries. It is important also to report bites to necessary departments if you're in a situation in which a wild animal is attacking victims or if there is a domesticated animal that poses a danger. It is important that the proper authorities are alerted so that the situation can be handled in whichever way is deemed necessary. Um, and just another interesting tidbit and important thing to remember is that the care for human bites is the same as you would care for an animal bite. It's just important to remember to clean the wound because um, human mouths can carry a lot of different bacteria and such. And so now we're going to kind of talk a bit about how to prevent bites and stings before they even occur. So it is important when going out to ensure that you wear repellent, you know, bug spray, um, sturdy boots and shirts with long sleeves and long pants. Your goal here is to kind of cover as much surface area as you can. Um, less skin exposed reduces the risk of a bite. As uh, Sarah talked about before, especially with ticks, you can tuck in loose clothing, including pant legs, which can be tucked into socks or boots and shirts, which can be tucked into your pants, or you can wear rubber bands or tape around your pant legs. And again, this is to minimize one surface area, but also prevent um, ticks and such from getting inside your clothing if you're able to kind of 
reduce the um, openings, you kind of reduce the risk of getting those insects on your body. Um, it's important to wear clothing with light colors and carefully inspect yourself after returning from an outdoor trip and shower immediately. It's important to kind of keep an eye out for insects such as ticks on your body and remove any loose ones with a shower. When out walking around, it is important to be aware of nests and try to avoid them. Obviously, if you walk into a beehive or a wasp's nest, the likelihood of a sting is very significantly high. Um, continuing on, it is also important to apply repellent to pets that go outdoors. You know, if you let your dog into the backyard, there's a great chance that they can pick up a tick and then bring that inside, which then will pose a risk to you. So if possible, apply repellent to your pets as well to prevent them from picking anything up and bringing them inside. When walking on trails, stay towards the center. If you're kind of walking along the outskirt, outskirts where there's loose brush or anything that kind of provides an opportunity for insects to get onto your body. Um, in regards to snakes, avoid areas that are known to have high snake populations. Be noisy as you walk as noise might scare them away. If you cross the path of a snake, go back the way you came. You don't want to kind of get into their way. And in regards to marine animals, if you find yourself kind of out in the ocean or in any other situation in which you might encounter marine animals, you can wear a wetsuit or a dry suit or any necessary footwear to help prevent bites and stings. Similar to before, this kind of reduces the surface area of exposed skin. And to prevent dog bites, it is important not to move past the dog too quickly. You don't wanna startle them because that may indicate to them that you are a threat. Try to remain still and avoid looking in its eyes. Again, you're trying to minimize um, your image as a threat to the dog. If a dog appears to be acting strange or if you don't recognize it, do not approach it. This could startle it. And before you pet a dog, even if it's like your friend's dog or someone walking down the street who said their dog is friendly, you wanna make sure you give the dog an opportunity to see and sniff you. And again, this just kind of gives it a chance to recognize you and realize that you aren't a threat. Okay, and so next we'll go into some test questions. So we'll read them out and then give you guys a second to answer before we provide the answer. So the first question is, which type of domestic or wild animal bite is the most common? And the correct answer for which type of domestic or wild animal bite is the most common is B, dog. Um, next question, anti-venom is used to counteract the effects of most poisonous spider bites, such as a brown recluse, true or false? The answer is false. Um, most spiders are non-poisonous, um, their bites, and an anti-venom is only used for black widows. Uh, when providing care for an insect bite, you should do which of the following? Uh, A, pull out with tweezers. B, leave it inside your skin. C, disinfect the sting site. Or D, apply heat to the sting site. Uh, the answer is C, disinfect the sting site. So which type of snake bite allows for the acceptable use of the pressure immobil immobilization bandaging technique? A, coral snake, B, rattlesnake, C, cottonmouth, or D, copperhead? And so the answer would be A, a coral snake. Okay, this one is, which type of tick-borne disease has a symptom of a characteristic skin rash known as a bullseye? So it's A, Lyme disease, B, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, C, Babesia infection, or D, ehrlichiosis. Well, 
And the answer for this one is gonna be A, Lyme disease. And then here's our sources and additional ones. And that is it.